polysyllabic profundity proverb. Reconnaissance and to date saltation. Or if you prefer, look before you leap. The Distinguished Dozen. Three Latin Invaders. Ante, A-N-T-E, before, as in anterior, antebellum, antedate, ante. Pet or pit, P-E-T or P-I-T, to go, to seek, to strive, as in compete, impetuous, propitious, pet or pit. Ben or bon, B-E-N or B-O-N, good, as in benefit, benevolent, Bennett. Bonus, Ben or Bon. Three little words. Don, Bob, and Joe. Don, D-O-N. To put or dress in. A Spanish gentleman. An Oxford or Cambridge fellow. The judge donned his robes. Don. Bob, B-O-B. A quick movement, a fishing float, a short haircut on a woman or child, to curtsy or bow, a shilling, and others. Ali could really bob and weave, bob. Joe, coffee, an American soldier, guy, fellow. Bill is a regular Joe, isn't he? Three Greek gifts. Apo, A-P-O, away, as in apostle, apocryphal, apogee, apo. Card, C-A-R-D, or cord, C-O-R-D, or cour, C-O-U-R. Heart, as in cardiac, cordial, affaire de cour. Card, or cord, or cour and Phil, P-H-I-L, love, as in philosophy, bibliophile, philharmonic, Phil. Three purloined foreign language expressions. Par excellence, excellent beyond comparison, epitome, P-A-R-E-X-C-E-L-L-E-N-C-E. The steak was par excellence. Gesundheit, G-E-S-U-N-D-H-E-I-T. It literally means good health. When a person sneezes, it's good luck for them if you say, Gesundheit. Tour de force, T-O-U-R-D-E-F-O-R-C-E. A remarkable achievement, a feat. Our governor's election was a tour de force. The, the Lollapalooza. The Lollapalooza is penultimate. P-E-N-U-L-T-I-M-A-T-E. Penultimate means next to last, like this chapter. Penultimate. Namaste. Let's concern ourselves today with the fine arts of articulate, that is professional level, writing and speaking. As always, as the lesson unfolds, let the knowledge of communication skills and the information about power vocabulary words dominate your thinking. We'll take writing and speaking together because they're so similar up to the time of final draft for writing and public address for speaking. In fact, the preparation stages are virtually identical. And speaking of preparation, or rather the lack of it, Therein lies the principal source of fear and loathing many persons suffer when it's time to write. And brother, do most people dodge writing and run full tilt from public speaking. For most of us, following the wisdom of the Boy Scout motto, be prepared, is the most propitious method of dispelling fear of failure, which is, of course, the source of our communication angst. It's hard to believe but for a majority of persons surveyed in a major study, the fear of death came in number two. 
the fear of public speaking was number one. Put to the test, no sane person would choose death over speaking, of course. But the statistic is certainly revealing of people's attitudes, isn't it? The point for us here is that writing and speaking need not be the odious, noisome, repugnant tasks they often seem to be. The key to liberation from such disquietude and to excellence of speaking and writing performance is preparation. Circumspect, erudite, prudent preparation. I'd like now to share my views on how best to prepare for writing and for speaking. Before we get to the meat of the matter, though, I want to review a few of the words I've just used to make sure we're remaining cognizant of our primary purpose, which is vocabulary development. Angst, A-N-G-S-T, that means anxiety, as in, a call from the boss filled me with angst. Odious, O-D-I, O-U-S, means abhorrent or offensive. Cleaning up after spot is an odious task, isn't it? Odious. Noisome, N-O-I-S-O-M-E. It means disgusting or dangerous. In fact, spot is noisome at times. Noisome. Repugnant, R-E-P-U-G-N-A-N-T. means repulsive or contradictory. Now that I think of it, spot is repugnant too. Repugnant. Disquietude, D-I-S-Q-U-I-E-T-U-D-E. It means uneasiness. My boss fills me with disquietude. A quick quiz. Odious is spelled O-D-I-O-U-S. Odious means abhorrent or offensive. Now, with definitions first, Say the words with me. Anxiety, angst. Abhorrent or offensive, odious. Disgusting or dangerous, noisome. Repulsive or contradictory, repugnant. Uneasiness, that's disquietude. The next set of words follows. Propitious, P-R-O-P-I-T-I-O-U-S. It means favorable or auspicious. Now is a propitious time to build a power vocabulary. Propitious. Circumspect, C-I-R-C-U-M-S-P-E-C-T. That means heedful of circumstances or consequences. The sly old fox was most circumspect. Erudite. E-R-U-D-I-T-E. It means learned and wise. Professor Umlaut is quite erudite. Prudent means careful in regard to one's own interests, provident. George Bush was prudent. Cognizant, C-O-G-N-I-Z-A-N-T. It means fully informed, conscious. Successful counterintelligence agents are always cognizant of the other side's activities. Cognizant. A quick quiz. Propitious is spelled P-R-O-P-I-T-I-O-U-S. Cognizant is spelled C-O-G-N-I-Z-A-N-T. Now in reverse order with definitions first, say them with me. Fully informed, conscious, Cognizant, careful in regard to one's own interests, prudent, learned and wise, erudite, heedful of circumstances or consequences, circumspect, favorable or auspicious, propitious. There you go, 10 solid words to know with special consideration given to the shades of meaning of related and synonymous words. The subject is transmissive communication preparation, writing and speaking. Let's get back to it. Before you write a word of your speech or paper, honor these prerequisites. It will pay huge dividends. Prerequisite one, 
Decide who the piece is being written for. Analyze your intended audience. Carefully determining before you begin the demographic and situational attributes of the person or persons reading or hearing your words is of paramount importance. Prerequisite two, why are you taking pen or keyboard in hand? Ascertain the true reason for your efforts. Your personal and professional rationale or rationales need to be carefully and unequivocally known to you. Avoid any and all vacillation or self-deception. It's just too important to be totally and completely aware of why you're writing, including, perhaps especially, the text of a speech you'll be giving. Prerequisite three, cogitate, investigate, deliberate as to your true intentions. What exactly do you want from your audience? Do you want to be forgiven, chosen, hired, selected, learned from, inspired by, heard out? Knowing precisely what you want to achieve, what you want from your readers or listeners, positively stimulates and influences your conscious thinking and your subconscious sense of appropriateness. What do you want to accomplish with your work? Prerequisite four. Okay, how now, brown cow? First aspect, how do you present yourself? How do you wish to sound? What will be your voice and tone, the relative difficulty level of the words you choose, your specificity and trenchancy? And, of course, there are the more mundane considerations of length, font, paper, and so on. Second aspect, do you need to do a little research, make a few calls, gather some material, interview an expert, find some reference materials? Make sure you not only sound, but actually are well-informed, genuine, and sincere. Those are my little secrets of the things really good writers do before they write the first word. I'll pause here and put a spotlight on a few interesting words used in the foregoing dialogue. Paramount. P-A-R-A-M-O-U-N-T. It means chief concerns, primary, foremost. The paramount objective is votes. Paramount. Trenchant. T-R-E-N-C-H-A-N-T. Here, trenchancy, means force and vigor. The sailor demonstrated a strong trenchancy. Mundane, M-U-N-D-A-N-E, means ordinary, earthly. Money is so mundane. Font, F-O-N-T. Font means type, size, and face, also spelled F-O-U-N-T. We are using a number 12 font. Dictum, D-I-C-T-U-M, means an authoritative pronouncement. The dictator dictated a dire dictum. Here's a quick quiz. What does mundane mean? Foremost, forceful, or ordinary? Mundane means ordinary. Once more, with definitions first, please say the vocabulary words with me. Chief concerns, primary, foremost, paramount, force and vigor, trenchant, ordinary, earthly, mundane, type size and face, font, authoritative pronouncement, dictum. There is another and very important aspect of composition that is beyond the scope of this recorded lesson. The missing aspect is that of the elements of correctness and style. If you need to refresh yourself on phrasing, usage, and style, or spelling, grammar, and diction, please seek those out in my Learning Strategies Corporation personal learning course, Four Powers for Greatness. Let's turn to the specific subject of oral presentations, especially speech making. There are three phases of speech preparation. One, the ideas information gathering phase. Two, 
the planning organization phase, and three, the writing phase. These three phases have already been treated suitably for our purposes here in the preceding discussion of composition preparation. They are essentially identical. The last phase of writing is final word processing and delivery. The last phase of public speaking is the oral presentation itself. The only comment I wish to make here is that there are only two major things you need to know or do in order to present an effective and interesting speech, role, lesson, lecture, sermon, talk, presentation, defense, or interview. The first requirement is to be prepared, occasionally even over-prepared. True confidence is made possible only by truly preparing for the task. The second requirement is to be natural. Be yourself. True oral competence, which requires that you be credible and convincing, is made possible only by naturalness. A classic example would be the incomparable Gettysburg Address of Abraham Lincoln. William Shakespeare had this to say about effective public presentation. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, tripping on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of you players do, I had as leave the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and, as I may say, whirlwind of passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Be not too tame, neither, but let your own discretion be your own tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance, that you overstep not the modesty of nature. I'd like now to conclude the writing and speaking part of our lesson by stating for you the seven C's of articulate human communication. The C's we speak of here are not faraway bodies of water, but rather seven easily accessible and absolutely essential recommendations, each of which begins with the letter C. When you write and when you speak, do whatever is necessary when preparing and when presenting to be correct, clear, complete, concise, courteous, credible, and convincing. As a memory aid, I'll say the seven in alphabetical order. Clear, complete, concise, convincing, correct, courteous, credible. A lesson regarding effective formal communication should include a few examples of faulty diction and usage. Let me acquaint you now with a few of the more important and more noticeable verbal gaffes. I do want to note here that colloquialisms are incorrect, quote unquote, but they are usually acceptable at the conversation level. However, colloquialisms are only rarely and outright incorrect words and terms are never appropriate in formal discourse. First, let's consider seven terms relevant to a consideration of English diction and usage. Cliché, C-L-I-C-H-E, frequently pronounced cliché, means a much overused expression, a trite phrase or idea, such as mean as a snake, cliché. Analogy, A-N-A-L-O-G-Y, means a logical inference that if two things are alike in some respects, they are probably alike in others, such as the old saw about fathers and sons, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. That's analogy. Metaphor, M-E-T-A-P-H-O-R. Metaphor means a comparison by describing one thing by ascribing characteristics of another thing, such as, that guy's a horse. It's a metaphor. Simile, S-I-M-I-L-E, means a comparison using the words like or as, such as, he fights like a tiger. 
That's simile. Idiom, I-D-I-O-M, means an accepted phrase that is contrary to the usual language pattern, such as, keep your shirt on, idiom. Euphemism, E-U-P-H-E-M-I-S-M, means an inoffensive term substituted for a harsher one, such as funeral home for mortuary. It's a euphemism. Non sequitur, one of my favorites. N-O-N-S-E-Q-U-I-T-U-R. Non sequitur means a statement to which no answer or response seems appropriate. Such as, in the midst of a conversation about drought, someone says, I have small feet. That's a non sequitur. Here's a quick quiz. The phrase, that'll knock your socks off, is an example of what? Idiom, idiomatic speech. Now for six pairs of words, often used as synonyms, but which are not synonyms. It's very important to know the following distinctions and differences in diction and usage. The first is aggravate, A-G-G-R-A-V-A-T-E, means to make things worse. Irritate, I-R-R-I-T-A-T-E, means to annoy. An annoying person is irritating. Two, nauseous, N-A-U-S-E-O-U-S, means sickening, disgusting, causing to vomit. Nauseated, N-A-U-S-E-A-T-E-D, means sickened or disgusted or ill at the stomach. Ernst makes Laura nauseated. Three, quote, Q-U-O-T-E, Quote is a verb meaning to cite or refer to another's work. Quotation, Q-U-O-T-A-T-I-O-N, is a noun meaning a passage or proverb that is quoted. The million dollar vocabulary contains many quotations. Four, famous, F-A-M-O-U-S, means renowned, publicly acclaimed, celebrated. Notorious, N-O-T-O-R-I-O-U-S, means known widely, of course, but regarded unfavorably. Infamous, terrorists are notorious. Five, criteria, C-R-I-T-E-R-I-A, means standards of judgment, rules for testing. Criterion, C-R-I-T-E-R-I-O-N, is one criteria. Similar to that, number six, media, M-E-D-I-A. Media means all means of mass communication. Medium, M-E-D-I-U-M, means one form of mass communication, as in radio is a mass communication medium. And finally, six interesting usage considerations. The first is which. Which is a reference to something previously mentioned or understood, never for referring to a person. Use who or that for people, such as the love of archery, which we have been discussing, or that which is beautiful is a joy forever. That brilliant and loving rhetoric professor, or he who hesitates is lost. The cardinal principle here between which and that is never use which when referring to a person. Two, unique, U-N-I-Q-U-E. Unique is a great word. It means peerless, one of a kind. One may never correctly use a modifier or intensifier with unique. It's not necessary. It's redundant. Try to avoid saying things like more unique, most unique quite unique, very unique, really unique, totally unique, and so on. Number three, regardless, R-E-G-A-R-D-L-E-S-S, -S, means heedless, unmindful, or in spite of everything, or anyway. Irregardless is colloquial. It doesn't really mean anything. Number four, Avoid saying that when you mean very in sentences such as, he was not that talented. 
Number five, a lot is two words. A-L-O-T is not actually a word, it's a misspelling. And six, avoid saying ain't when you mean not and don't got when you mean don't have. Yes, there are dictionary entries for them, but they make you sound unlettered and careless. How about a quick quiz? The cardinal rule of the which and that consideration is what? Never use which when you're referring to a person. That brings us to the end of our lesson. Your playbook includes an interesting expansion of the lesson as well as a review of the words and concepts we covered. Remember to use your playbook, it's a jewel. Our Bennett Diction. For this lesson, we have three Bennett Dictions because we have a number of subjects. Bulwer Lytton said, the pen is mightier than the sword. Tibullus, long before Bulwer Lytton said, speech is a mirror of the soul. As a person speaks, so is that person. And the British poet Southey said this, if you would be pungent, be brief. It is with words as it is with sunbeams. The more they are condensed, the deeper they burn. Sayonara.